I will try to present uh, some comments on a few text passages read by early Christians. The interest is semantics, and I intend, I think, to discuss changes in communicative contexts and those changes implications for the discussion of semantics. Some uh, preliminary comments first. The early Christian texts were read and written were uh, written by men, those texts that we read, written by men, even if the texts we read now later have become canonical texts, we cannot presuppose that they represent authoritative or mainstream Christianity at the time they were written or were read for the first time. They were written by men who tried to achieve something through writing the very text. Further, a text like a text written by Paul from Tarsus, the text writes itself into a literary tradition through formulations, allusions, citations, and references. And the use and understanding of the text required a certain measure of literacy on behalf of the text users. Paul never meant his text to be sacred texts. They were meant to be part of a formative or educative dialogue with fellow believers. And it is a challenge to discuss the meaning of the ancient text with, about love and take full account of the presuppositions formed in the cultural tradition we belong to. And I cannot, for my part, claim to know this tradition explicitly. Uh, most of you know it better than I. Uh, for me, it exists as fragments from an education and in the general language of our culture, and not least the Christian culture, which I'm strongly influenced by. And also, love is one of those, if not the great positively, positively charged word. So when we talk about it, we take care not to destroy it. We would like to amplify it, to fill it with positive values. Maybe because we would not know how to live without love. If you don't recognize so much of such positive amplification in my paper, it's not because I don't like love. It's, it's more about a critical reading of texts. And you may even find that, I'm, that I use a rather narrowed perspective. Then, trying to follow a path in the forest of many texts and interesting passages and perspectives, I decided to look for love as a term of relation. Love is a term of relation. It links quality to relations. So when talking about loving the neighbor, it's obvious that relations between humans is the place for this term. And further then, when we talk about relations in our disciplines, it suggests itself to link it to social relations. Social roles, power in relations, Relations that knit groups together, give groups identity, and the lack of relations or negatively charged relations mark the boundaries between groups. It also comes close to link relations to values. Morals is about relations, and it seems obvious that love is a main principle in the morals reflected in the texts of early Christians. And then thirdly, in Judaism, Christianity and Islam, love is also relevant for the God-human relation. Therefore, love is also a theological term. All of this, and even more, is relevant for the reading of early Christian texts. And in this paper, then, it is important to try to keep on to the relational aspects in reading the reading of the text passages. So then a first short text, and there are a lot of texts in the Christian Bible that either contain a word for love or show topics that we relate to the concept of love. And I can only comment on four or five texts, and the selection may also be somewhat accidental. There is a text in the Gospel of John, in chapter 13. Uh, the speaker in the text, Jesus, says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love 
for one another. Shortly, I will point to the two relations that are paralleled in terms of quality of love. But firstly, some comments on the words used. And it probably comes as no surprise that the words translated love here are the Greek verb agapao and the noun agape. Many Christians know, and those who have studied Christian religion have learned that agape is a prominent word for Christian love. This was made clear yesterday. In classical or Koine Greek, agape was a rare word and had a rather limited use. It was not the common Greek word for notions we would translate with love. Eros and philia were the common Greek words for love, and agapao could mean to be satisfied with something, to greet with affection, to be fond of, something like that. In the New Testament, agapao and agape is the main word for love. I'm not suggesting that love thereby has taken on a distinct new meaning, differing clearly from philosophical or other literary notions of love in Greek literature. In the use of agape, the New Testament writers were dependent on the Septuagint. In the second century before Christ, some Jews began a translation of the important Hebrew scriptures, and first of all the Torah, later the Psalms and the Prophets, and sometime after the birth of Christ, probably most of the books we know, we know as the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament were translated. And the collection is then called the Septuagint, which has been mentioned, which is mentioned also before today. In those translations, the Greek word agape became the prominent word for rendering Hebrew words for love. I think in this, I uh, checked it just, I think in this translation, Eros, uh, there are two occasions for Eros in the Proverbs uh, in the Septuagint. When this happened, the Greek words agapao, agape, entered new contexts and took on new meanings. That is, experienced new usages. The word or words obviously then came to refer to notions that in other Greek literature are expressed with philia and eros. And words from the Agape family occur 341 times and are found in every book of the New Testament. In the first letter of John, it occurs 52 times. In the letter to Ephesians, 22 th two times. And it's very frequent in Paul. We turn to John 13 again. In John 13, the authorial voice renders a commandment. And in the context of this written gospel, it is a divine commandment. As far as it is in the literary world of the gospel is spoken by the Son of God. And the ideal reader believes that the one who speaks the one who gives the new commandment is the Lord that is dead and is risen. To give a command presupposes a relation. I have loved you. A relation between the Lord Jesus and the believing reader, represented by the listening disciples in the text. This relation is linked directly to the other relation, the relation between the believers, that you love one another. The first relation seems to be a model for the other relation. The title of my paper emphasizes love for the neighbor, that is, the relation between humans. John 13 talks about love between believers. One question then concerns the motivation for the commandment for mutual love 
And another question, what the commandment means in terms of mindsets and notions. Motivation is complex. And we might understand something of the motivation communicated in uh, a text like this if we ask for the notions that might have been linked with the sayings. And in the present text, uh, the link seems established through in the same way, just as. In the same way as I have loved you, you should also love one another. The Lord's love for the Adversaries is the pattern to follow, the example. And here it might lead further to ask in what way then the Lord Jesus has loved the disciples, the believers. And later in the writing then, the words on the commandment and the relations are developed. In chapter 15, the Lord teaches, and here is a lengthy uh, passage, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. Let me skip a couple of verses. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that, uh, that you may... Uh, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that, last, that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The highest expression of love spoken of here is a person who puts his life at the disposal of his friends. This then probably refers to the knowledge of the author and the readers that the speaker of those words in fact were crucified. It indicates then that the passion of Jesus and Christ and his cross and crucifixion serve as example for the believers in their relations to the fellow believers. This is commented on in 1 John 3.16, and I hope I have the text here, yes. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We know loved by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the, words, uh, the world's goods and see a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let's love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Here in the new revised version, there is an asterisk by sister here. In the Greek text it says, brother Adelphos, but this uh, translation then adds all the time spent brother and sister and brothers and sisters in the text. The model is found in Jesus Christ giving his life and the letter points to how it should be practiced also. One who sees a brother or sister in need and refuse help. Love not in word or speech but in truth and action. The model is found in Christ giving his life. And by this we have reminded ourselves of some notions connected with the Johannine language of love. And the same motive is also used by Paul when he talks about his sufferings. 
a couple of other traits in John 15 before we leave. The analogy, it starts with an analogy of the vine and the branches, an illustration that then is applied on the readers, the listeners. The branches belonging on the vine means in plain words to keep my commandments, verse 10. To keep my commandments. In many texts we find the word commandment in the context of love. It occurs throughout and is dominant in the text read from John 15. And lastly then, before we leave John, I would also like to comment on the language of friendship in John 15. I've added the Greek words here in, in brackets. Friends, philos, the Greek word, and no longer servants, doulos, or slaves. The sentences in John's Gospel show no friendship in terms of equality. It is friendship in terms of shared knowledge. The disciples, these friends of Christ, are conveyed knowledge of a kind that servants or slaves normally do not get. And we could suggest the semantics referring to slaves obeying orders without knowing their master's plan, without knowing the reason or purpose. In this context, the Adresees should know the reason and the purpose of loving one another. The reader should see the bigger picture within which loving the fellow believer makes sense. But this is still no friendship in terms of equality. It is envisaged in hierarchical relations. God is the highest level. John's Jesus calls him the Father. Jesus has kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. And Jesus gives his commandments to the believers, the ones below him in the hierarchy. So it might perhaps be adequate to talk about love and egalitarian relations on one level among the believers who shall love one another. They may be thought of as equal, perhaps. But the bigger picture is a hierarchy, where God the Father is on the top, the Son below him, and the Son again gives his commandments to the groups of adherents, his groups of followers. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last. I am giving you these commands. In the texts we have read so far, the Lord is the active part in the relation between the Lord and the humans. The Lord loves humans. The Lord's love for humans is the motivation and the pattern or model for the mutual love between the believers. And other texts reflect the same pattern. We, sh we would just shortly look at a couple of texts, more one by Paul in Galatians. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. The active part from God here, you were called. God is the active. And then at the end there, the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the first letter of John again, we love because he first loved us. The asterisk here is to suggest the possibility that this should be, uh, that the text should be read as an admonition. We should love because he first loved us. And then, as successor of Paul in Ephesians, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This sounds very similar to texts in the Johannine literature, although the last texts here in Ephesians seem <coughs> somewhat, seem somewhat complex. Um, but I'm not going to comment further on that. Just uh, trying to make a transition through a couple of questions. 
Among the interesting questions arising after the consideration so far are how do the two relations of the texts um, influence one another or interact with one another? How do the semantics of the texts expressing the two relations inform one another? It seems clear that the God relation has priority. The relation is the frame within which the love for the neighbor is developed. But then secondly, in which form and in which contexts can the one relation motivate the other? Is it through reasoning? Is it through experiences? Or is it through admonition? Or is it through some other, some, some other means? I do not know if I can um, even suggest an answer, but the question may follow us when we look at a couple of further texts. And now I would like us also to read a couple of texts that later got into the Hebrew Bible, texts that, we, that were the most important literary texts for the first Christian believers. We find texts speaking of similar relations as those we have seen until now, now, and also texts which link the God relation with the relations between humans. We go to the law, the Torah. Deuteronomy 10. And in the middle of a passage there we read, Although heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, the earth with all that is in it, yet the Lord set his heart in love, on your ancestors alone and chose you, their descendants after them, out of all peoples, as it is today. The Lord set his heart in love. If we were the addressees of these texts, we could uh, imagine, so the Lord has chosen you, has chosen to love you, it is perhaps like a boy, and I'm talking with the experience of a boy now, who has noticed that one girl, the most beautiful girl in the world. There seems to be only one girl in the world. And one day you realize that the most amazing thing has happened. She has chosen you before all other boys in your neighborhood, in your town, before all other boys in the world actually, before those really handsome boys, those intelligent boys, that witty boy, she has chosen you. And you are the happiest man in the world, the most grateful boy in the world. This marvelous thing has happened to you. And your overwhelming feelings and your gratitude just flows over. You get friendly and generous to show interest, to be considerate, is no problem. It's not difficult to be friendly, even to those who do not have a friendly attitude themselves. From the text again, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors alone and chose you out of all peoples. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So as the love of God hits you, it is no problem, it should be no problem also to love the stranger. But let's then read a bit more from the literary context. Sentences that make the picture more complex and reflecting a development you perhaps would experience in the relation to the most beautiful girl. She is still the greatest girl in the world, but she shows herself to be demanding. She is controlling. She shows herself to be a jealous lover. So what does she require of you? So now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. And then the passage we have already read about 
uh, the Lord and his love. Verse 16. Circumcise then the foreskin of your heart and do not be stubborn any longer for the Lord God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, the mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe. Who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God, him alone you shall worship. To him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise, is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. <coughs> So what does it require of you? Only, it says in the first line there, is this easy? Only to fear, to walk in his ways, to serve the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, to keep the commandments, it does in fact not seem particularly easy what he requires of you. Notice further the word commandments also in this text. And that the assurance of God's love, the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors and you, this assurance is followed up by an admonition to um, circumcise your heart by a request. Notice also the words about fear and worship here at the end of the passage. There could be several things, of course, here to comment, uh, but let me just briefly highlight two traits. In the context of this uh, paper, at least, it seems too important to notice the two relations here linked together. God's love for humans, the love from human to human. And then it seems important to stress the second relation and its character. It's not only love for your brother and sister, the children of Israel, you shall also love the stranger. And this love of stranger have two motivations in the text as far as I can see. The God who loves you also loves the stranger. The God who loves you also loves the strangers. Here also God's love is example for the love between humans. And the text lays this out concretely in verse 18. God, he uh, executes justice for the orphan and the widow, loves the stranger, providing them food and clothing. The second motivation, you shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Um, I'm not ready to, to try to explore what this motivation actually contains. But um, anyhow, it's a large discussion in itself. The question of how these words of loving the strangers relate to the several other texts in the Hebrew Bible on enemies, on opponents, on the relations with non-Israelites. But I will not try to go into that. Now, I would like to develop uh, shortly on the relations within which love is a quality. Try to develop uh, somewhat on the relations and the semantics of the texts communicating about them. Firstly, there seems to be some experiences from modern life that is relevant for understanding those old texts about love. But there are also elements in the text that are strange to this field of meaning. And I would now like to formulate a couple of principles that are important for my discussion of semantics. The first one is that social experiences are preconditions for the semantics in the talk about relational love. Social experiences are preconditions for the semantics in the talk about relational love. And there are no exceptions for the talk about the love of God 
even if you claim God's love to be of another, of another quality. Social experiences are preconditions for the semantics in the talk about divine love. And the second precondition, between cultures there are huge differences in social relations and in the experiences learned from social relations. This goes for the more romantic or emotional loaded fields of meaning suggested above and also for other fields of meaning. And for the text read it seems relevant also to consider a political sphere and the political includes moral and ethics. Let's then dwell on the semantics of those two fields of meaning um, shortly. First, the notions of emotional loaded fields of meaning, if it's possible to describe it this way. We could ask how relevant our conceptions of romantic love are for understanding the texts in John and Deuteronomy. But then, given that they have some relevance, we speak of notions related to romantic love, to love declarations. We are talking about an emotionally loaded field of meanings. To be loved or to hear a declaration of love, you feel like the chosen one. You do not, you do not just perceive or hear it as thought, as concepts. You may hear the words directed to you, a voice moves the air, physical waves reach your ear, move your eardrums, listening is a physical thing. You hear words directed to you communicating you are the chosen one. Those signs then, sounds or written characters, if you grasp them, create cognitive images, but also possibly your emotions are moved. The declaration of love may create an immediate response in you, in your emotions, in your will, in your heart if you like. And your body responses without the signs being processed in your thoughts, without being initiated by your rational reflections. And if we talk about Deuteronomy 10, we could even suggest a ritual setting. A ritual setting where the text is recited and the ritual setting amplifying the emotional and experiential impact of the text. And now the second field of meaning, the political sphere. The God here in Deuteronomy 10 requires to walk in all his ways, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of your Lord, your God and his decrees that I'm commanding you today for your own well-being. Those words serving, commandments, your own well-being, this may be read as political language. The God is the ruler. He is the Lord, the ruler of the earth and also of the heavens. He is your king, your political ruler. How does this God love you? How does a ruler love his people? And how does a member of this people experience the love of the ruler? It's not like falling in love with that charming boy or girl who then turns out to be a prince or princess and you live happily ever after. For those notions related to the political field of meanings, we would consider the bodily experiences of relating to a superior authority. Bodily experiences like gestures you have to perform in the concrete encounters. We could consider the feelings of fear, but also hope fear of the power with which the, authority, which the authority may execute to harm. But on the other hand, hope in the power of that superior that is able to change your situation to the better. 
I'm talking here about the impact of communicating or perceiving the text, how we, an audience, perceive, how concepts are activated and how memories are evoked. And those memories may be of a kind that some like to call bodily memories or bodily experiences. They are immediate, sensual reactions, not mediated through reason or thought, but memories from gestures, actions and emotions in relations. The texts read so far have referred to God as the active loving part in the God-human relation. The alternate direction of activity, human love for God, is also spoken of in these texts and would lead on to other interesting and also well-known texts. Um, um, the most well-known uh, texts may be from Deuteronomy, is Deuteronomy 6, the one with Shema, Hear, O Israel. And in this text, in Deuteronomy, there is no talk about loving your, your stranger or your, your fellow believer, but is said in um, clear words here, I, I want, don't want to read it, that your God, um, he is a jealous God. It says, fell down in the text, when the Lord has brought you into the land, take care not to forget him. Do not follow other gods, <coughs> any of the gods, uh, and so forth. Uh, the God who is present with you is a jealous God. He is a jealous lover. And now I'll try to reach, in a few minutes, some sort of, uh, some sort of conclusion. God is watching over you to see that your love is only for him and no one else. And not only outwards, but in your heart, in your will. It says here in this well-known text, here, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love him, the Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. You shall keep his words in your heart. That is, you shall recite them to your children, talk about them when you, when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. These are, these are the words of your jealous king, your jealous king lover, this Lord shall be in your consciousness day and night, home and away. You shall recite them, talk about them. They shall be your identity, who you are. Bind them as a sign on your hand, emblem on your forehead. His word shall be like the wedding ring on your finger. There is no place of your own. God is a jealous lover and his love controls all your thoughts, all your time, all your places. There are no exits. There is no exodus. These sentences should, however, rather be thought of in political categories. And I'm citing shortly Jan Asman, an Egyptologist. He writes, the jealousy of the biblical God is a political effect, roused by the wrongdoing of a contractual partner rather than the infidelity of a beloved. I would also like now at the end to uh, cite um, a book that I, I heard also have my students read, a biblical scholar, Christopher Stanley, and what he writes in a fine introduction to the Hebrew Bible. He writes about the language of the God relation in the Psalms. Most of the prayers in the book of Psalms revolve around the needs and joys of the individual or the larger community. Prayers of this type usually assume that the supernatural realm operates much like the hierarchical societies in which nearly all of the major religions originate. Requests for divine assistance place the worshipper in the physical and emotional posture of a differential and self-effacing peasant seeking a favor from the local landowner 
while expressions of praise and thanksgiving recall the flattery and obeisance that courtiers use when seeking favors from a king. And both types of prayer presuppose that the supernatural world exercises significant power over human affairs and must be treated with respect, and so forth. Christopher Stanley points to huge differences in cultural ideas and value judgments and also writes that the challenge by understanding the texts is to enter imaginatively into the mindset of people who view the world very different from most of us today. We in our society are convinced that we will get what we are entitled to from the authorities without having to fall to the ground on our faces before an official and without having to praise or sing hymns to the municipality. Nonetheless, if we are pious Jews, Christians or Muslims, we use a language in our hymns and liturgies that originally were at home in a to us very foreign context. We sing the praises to God even we, if we have no idea of the more original semantic and experiential context for such praises. And when the semantic context is forgotten, what do the words actually mean? This may lead into, a, lead into a broader discussion of religious language, but it has some relevance for the language of love in the biblical texts. And there I have to end with no conclusion and no uh, <laughs> constructive or positive statements about love, but um, just to point to some of the problems that I have uh, envisaged or developed as I, as I said, painting myself into a sort of corner here, <laughs> following some traits in the texts. Thank you. <laughs>